In this episode, we gain the blessings of three of the Five Isle Elemental Lords, visit the firewall of the game itself and fight back against the invading viruses, and then we finish the game. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strife Hayes, and this is the final episode of the incredible adventure through the Otherland MMO. 80 hours of gameplay, 810 gigabytes of footage, 10 YouTube episodes, nearly half a million total series views, almost 100 Patreon supporters, and one epic journey. Today, this insane adventure comes to a satisfying close. I need to be honest with you. Episodes 1 to 9 of this series contain roughly 7 to 8 hours of gameplay each, condensed into a 30 to 50 minute video. The script for each episode is roughly 7,000 words, but this episode is different, because this episode is about 20 hours of gameplay condensed into one action-packed finale. In this episode, I won't be going into as much detail about the specifics because honestly, the specifics from here on out don't change much. The glitches we've all seen before, the quirks and oddities have gone from being novel to being expected. There's only so many times you can kill 10 enemies in various areas before you're only moving on to see what the next new area is, and that ultimately was what I was doing. In this video, I'm going to show you the entire end section of the game, and believe me, it's long. I'll be cutting out all the repetition, all the kill X or collect X, and focusing on what this game really excels at. Scenery, location, and set pieces. In this video, I'm going to let the beauty of the environmental design speak for itself, because trying to explain the grandeur of this part of the game is like watching someone else on holiday, or seeing pictures of a trip you weren't invited to. Words don't do this game justice in its final hours. It's a flawed masterpiece. It's close to being a diamond in the rough. It's a forgotten adventure, greater than it had any right to be. And it is truly unforgettable. This game has massive glaring flaws, but it also has lashings of magic, moments of genius, and an overwhelming, overpowering sense of fun and fantasy. So grab a drink and settle in as we venture forth and save Otherland. The Wood Isle Cave is infested with demons, so we make short work of those. The Damp Cave is beautiful, as you'd expect, which leads to a cutscene on a hill. Our old friend Rage Guns is back and explains how Five Isle is in serious danger and we need the blessings of several elemental lords to be powerful enough to fight back against the Neo Grail. The Woodmaster is nearby. He sends us to gather ten fruit from a nearby fruit forest. It's through this gorgeous misty rainforest path and after collecting a few we need to defend the master from being attacked. Then follow Rage down this rocky path, chat to a child whose parents were taken by demons and then go kill a load in revenge. And demons will feature very heavily from now on. Also, every single combat encounter from here on out takes a lot of time. They are all kill 10 or kill 20, but the enemies are starting to need the damage over time effect to kill. The HP has actually been balanced assuming I'm going to use that attack, and if I don't, they take a full minute or two to kill each, meaning each quest is now taking about half an hour. The demons live inside this massive multi-floor treehouse with rope bridges and planks of wood getting us from one level to another, and it's just gorgeous to run up and down, and we need to escort rage guns all the way to the bottom while killing just so many demons. You know, this game should have been one player, and I'll explain this point further, but this really should just be a one player adventure game. Take all the locations. Take the story, take the dialogue, make it one player. Replace the MMO style combat system with a Dark Souls or Bloodborne or even God of War combat thing and make it an epic fantasy one player game. I guarantee it would sell. Well, I'd buy it at least. This game has no reason to be an MMO. There's no systems that actually enhance the MMO-ness of the game. Yes, there are dungeons and dailies once you reach the max level cap and PvP battlegrounds, but this is a linear, single-player adventure at its core. And it's an absolutely amazing one. Its main storyline is almost 80 hours long. It's longer than most single-player games are now. Making this into an MMO actually weakens the core game. There is a good MMO idea here somewhere, but it would take a lot of tweaking to actually find and make work. 
We fight down to the heart of the forest, this huge tree, and then survive several waves of enemy attacks. Cue another cutscene of the tree exploding with power and killing the enemies. Seems nature does fight back when pushed. Now this is a really stupid design choice here. You need to talk to the heart of the forest to carry on, and that means you need to look up. But nowhere else does it say this, and this has never been a thing you need to do in the game. The tree needs us to empower three local nature shrines to restore its power, so we go and do that. First off is the incredible giant lily pad forest. Enormous seeds bigger than us with sprouts and stems of plants with massive lily pads far above us. So we wade through this beautiful swamp and run up the nearby misty mountain path. The first task in this forest is to kill ten demons, which is slightly more challenging because these demons have the one-hit kill grenade as part of their standard attack rotation. More enemies, in fact, many enemies from this point onwards, will have the unblockable, unstoppable, one-hit kill attack. Fan-bloody-tastic. I die to the grenade many times many times, and then finally win. We gather up a load of local explosives and go to destroy the demon dock. So demons in Otherland are actually technologically advanced, and their base is a star dock. They've got these tesseract-style cubes around the place and actual spaceships flying around. You'll catch glimpses of it as it circles overhead. With the demon dock destroyed, we escape with the villagers, and this is a god awful quest. Probably one of the worst. You need to get these two NPCs down a hill to the lily pad forest. But the hill is lined with enemies, and the enemies are aggressive, and if one enemy hits one of the NPCs, they run back to the very start. Now no joke, this quest took me about 10 attempts and over an hour to do. You need to kill every enemy on the hill, and then start the quest, and hope the NPCs follow you before the enemies respawn. Finally, get them to the forest and the main magical lily is now corrupted and tries to eat the villagers. So we kill the giant lily and then lead the villagers away. With the lily shrine cleansed, we're now off to the leaf forest. The leaf forest is gorgeous because everything in this game is gorgeous, but in another idiotic design choice, you need to look up again for the next quest. This section of the game does this a lot, and I'm all for using the vertical design space to enhance a game's mechanics, but when you don't let players know that you're doing that, it's going to cause a lot of confusion. Have a chat to this monkey in a tree, then go steal some weapons for him, then follow Pukang through the forest and marvel as he runs right into a tree trunk, clips up onto the top of the canopy and runs out of sight. Kill some infected bogarts and journey into this foreboding misty mushroom forest. The valley itself is gorgeous. Deep ravines filled with foliage and endless sightlines of the nature-filled distance below. Find Orlando in this bogart village. He is hurt, so I rally the local warriors and lead them out of the dangerous forest, stopping along the way to kill some deadly blue mushrooms. If you're thinking, wow, this plot seems to be going a little off the rails, then you are right. In the last 20 hours of the game, honestly, it's just such a dead collection of kill X or guide people around quests. The only saving grace are the incredible locations because at this point the game sends you from place to place at a breakneck speed. The boss here is a giant evil mushroom and once it's dead the mushroom shrine is saved, that's two shrines down, one more to go. Now begins the hard part, well the beginning of the harder part. I need to steal some weapons but see those silver winged demons, the ones taller than me and much more aggressive. One of their basic attacks is the insta kill grenade and it's a regular attack they'll sometimes open a fight with. Sometimes they'll weave it into combat and sometimes they'll do it as they're dying. But the moment I see the purple swirl of death graphic, I'm done for. The only way I can pass this section is by burning the demon down before they use the attack, and if I draw the aggro of two or more demons at the same time, I am basically dead. This section is the hardest part of the game, because the insta-kill grenade is heartless and frequent, and if you get to this bit, I assure you, you will die a lot. I die so often, I even need to return to the Lambda Mall and fix my equipment because I can't find a vendor in this forest not surrounded by insta-killing demons, and I'm losing a lot of money and soma by dying so often. I bring all the weapons back to the good monkey and they say, quickly, go and kill that messenger monkey. Now, hitting an enemy is hard at the best of times, but when they are running away and combat isn't connecting, it's worse. Thankfully, the dots are broken in my favor here. Kill a load of demon guards and free some monkey men 
and here begins the worst quest in the game. And you might have heard me say that a lot already. Now, I might call many more quests the worst quest in the game, and I'm right every single time. Every quest in this section of the game is the worst quest in the game. I need to guide a load of monkey men back through the demon infested forest to the good monkey camp. This means the game is combining the systems of awful NPC following and pathfinding with inconsistent aggro ranges from enemies and allies, and if one of the monkeys starts a fight with a demon, which they will, the demon can use the grenade and kill everyone. I had to restart this quest so many times I stopped bothering to mark it down. This was truly an awful gameplay experience. Turn off the damage over time until it is fixed. With the good monkeys saved, we can go and assault the evil monkey village. Kill 10 monkeys and 10 demons, and this is basically a case of my damage over time attack versus your damage over time attack. Whoever hits first, wins. It's tedious and I hate it. Enemies dealt with, find the leaf shrine, brief cutscene of the good monkeys reclaiming it, and with all the shrines saved, I can return to the heart of the forest. Back at the heart, I finally hit level 60, max level. Now, with how well paced the game has been, you'd assume I'm nearly done, but nope, we've got about 15 hours of gameplay left if playing efficiently. So, here we go. I'm now granted the blessing of the forest and told to go to the demon extraction zone. I need to free some captured forest guardians. The demon tech is a nice mix of occult and futuristic, with shrines to strange gods mixed with electrical panels and nixie tubes, the cubes of storage containers and laser guns sitting equally next to wooden spears and feathered wings. Even the giant tree trunks have sections cut from them horizontally and replaced with digital load-bearing light frames. It's a fantastic contrast and it makes for a very striking style. I don't bother fighting the demons, I just find one guardian away from everyone else and free him six times, waiting for him to respawn between interactions, because it's safer than aggroing the insta-kill village. After this, I need to collect 15 weapons scattered around and then go and kill 15 demons. Holy content padding Batman. I need to kill the 15 demons one at a time, because once I'm outnumbered, I might as well just lie down and die. With the blessing of the forest, I can now free the guardsmen and transform them into hulking tree titans. I can also bless actual trees to turn them into bigger tree titans. And eventually, I've got a small army of tree titans fighting alongside me, and we charge together into the demon ranks, a clash of metal and branch. I sneak into the demon base while the skirmish is happening and plant a load of bombs around the place, and then we get another lovely cutscene where everything is going super well until the celestial dragon, remember her from the water village? shows up and kills some super important NPCs. We talk to Orlando and he even says, Oh, the Celestial Dragon. I forgot about her. With the demon invasion of the Water Isle mostly sorted and the blessing of the forest gained, we return to the monastery and I use my super special forest blessing to plant some new wood elementals in the garden. Then Lien Shen, the monastery leader, sends me to the Water Isle because every part of Five Isle is being attacked at the same time and apparently I'm the only one competent enough to deal with it. Now, you might have noticed that it's called Five Isle, but there are only three isles. The Water Isle, the Wood Isle, and the Fire Isle. The other two isles, involving the Metal Isle and the Air Isle, were planned expansions, but because the MMO never did that well, haven't come out yet. In the future, though, you never know. The monastery approach to the Water Isle airship dock is fantastic. A flat, thin, tiled path running between two sides of layered waterfalls, crashing down beside me and filling up small pools of water that then spill off into the sky below. The brilliant blue of the falling water glistening as the light rays behind filter through and make the whole screen sparkle. On the water aisle, have a chat to the leader, then go and heal some people, because I'm not just a monkey herder, I'm also a paramedic. And the water aisle is reminiscent of the original oriental water village from the start of the game. A wooden village built in a lake with wooden poles holding up planked walkways and tiered buildings built in tight formations, reds and gold painted everywhere and flags hanging around giving the place a very oriental feel. However, the village is also under demon attack, so there's a lovely section in the middle where the destruction begins. You can see half the roof of a building caved in, the walkways splinter and sink into the water below. You can see the exact part of the village the demonic cannon bombardment actually hit. The next quest sees me gathering supplies from local ships, and finally the underwater questing space is used. We have to swim down to this sunken galleon and retrieve the cargo. 
sort everyone out and fight some demons inside a building and in a lovely touch killing the demons spawns these little woodlouse looking creatures called glitches now as cute as they are these glitches are deadly they have a very high damage over time attack and they hit very quickly and they spawn in groups of three or four so they can drain my health super fast if not dealt with journey out the village onto this very bloody battleground between the village rebels and the demons seriously there's a lot of dead body assets and pools of blood placed around then venture into this small water temple and kill a portal. Now as a Zelda gamer the words water and temple next to each other make me very nervous but thankfully it's just a big room with two small bridges over a small river and then steps leading up to the portal. I kill the portal by stabbing it because that's how physics works and then go and pick up 25 magical herbs from the blood-stained battlefield outside. I do stop often to spin the camera around and marvel at the on-fire docks, the shimmering water, the blurred smoke and the lashing flames in the distance, the screams of the dying and the silence of the dead. It's a morbid but artistically stunning experience. This quest needs me to make potions and thankfully there's a book called How to Make Potions next to the equipment used for making potions but good lord the interaction bar fills very slowly on this. This is the slowest it's filled in the entire game. And only a few moments later I'm swimming across the water to save a flaming barge packed full of orphans. You know this battle ripped village really does lend itself to an action packed quest chain and the adrenaline has not stopped since the moment I got here. I'm now sent to the village on the outskirts to help them untangle some fishing nets. So yeah, the quests might need a bit of adrenaline balancing. This isn't exactly as exciting as saving orphans from a flaming boat. But the next quest is gorgeous. Fox hunting in this dense bamboo glade. Water either side of me traversing a narrow mud path with bamboo reeds rising so high and planted so thick I can barely see five feet in front of me. This is a lovely little section. It reminds me quite a lot of the game Tenchu on the PlayStation 1, which is another thing I'll need to go back and replay at some point. A cutscene shows the local villagers now trying to appease the demon overlords and make peace with them and work together. This goes as well as you'd expect with the demon lord cutting down the villager leader in cold blood. And this leads to me escorting the remaining villagers away from the demons and over a nearby bridge. Oh, check out the demon fortress in the distance. The neon red of the wireframe is just stunning. You can see this is definitely an advanced staging ground for their assault over the whole of the Water Isle. Are you ready for another worst quest? I need to escort six villagers from here to the extraction point, but this is somewhat challenging because only five villagers spawn in. I have to drop and restart this quest like five times before six NPCs even appear, and then you get attacked by demons and I have to keep them all alive. If I ever meet the man who invented the escort mission in MMORPGs, I'm going to slap them. Villagers safe, now we're off to chat to the local lizard man tribe because apparently they're on our side too. So we kill three waves of demons as we go because every repetitive quest trope is now on full display. Oh joy, another stealth section in a game with no mechanics for stealth. I must return to the Lizardman village and eavesdrop on a conversation between the leader and a demon commander, but I can't be seen or get too close, but there's no indicators of how close I am. I pass this through sheer trial and error, and eventually I just stand in the middle of the village and it happens to work. It seems the village were considering joining the demons, but that is a bad idea, so I lead a charge against the demonic invaders. This bit is again really cool, the post level 60 bit of the game is such a mess of pointless kill x quests and then awesome leader charge against the demon moments. I just wish they got rid of the MMO part and built it as a single player adventure game. Even if it was still online get rid of the kill x quests and just make it about the important quest based missions. We blow up the local demon compound and another cutscene shows us that yep we do indeed win and now we are sent to probably the coolest area of the entire game. Remember that Five Isle is blocked off to portal transportation, that's why we had to use Orlando's apartment. Now the monastery is blocked from regular portals too and it's because the Neo Grail have manipulated the very firewall of the game. So now along with Orlando we travel up these incredible steps and enter the digital firewall framework. We go into the security protocol of the game, digitized and visualized for us and god this this is why I'm playing the game, just look at this. A black and silver hexagon tiled floor with tufts of browning grass 
growing between the digital cracks. Giant black cubes with red edging of various sizes stacked together to create walls and structures. A yellowing sky filled with rubble held silently in place. Structures floating above us from bridges to arches complete and then dissolving away at the ends. This is the safety net of the Otherland network and we need to fight through it to unblock travel to the Five Isle, but we are not alone. Unlike other fights, here you want to avoid confrontation. You've got two main types of enemies. These enemies called Demon Lords, flat disks of code sliding around on the floor, and they'll hurt you if you get near them. But thankfully, they've got a red circle area to show you how far away you need to stay. Oh, this is a brilliant, brilliant part of the game. And then we meet this. This is a virus. And this is what was ripping its way through the eight squared marriage ceremony in the previous episode. Now you can't fight it. And if you get too close, the virus teleports you back to the start of the virus section of the maze, which honestly is a much better system than killing you. It takes about 20 minutes because the map is no use here. And I need to traverse the firewall, conquering the maze of death and getting past the viruses it's holding back from Otherland itself to get to the next floor. And now the game finally uses the platforming elements to its advantage. I need to jump up this staggered and unstable staircase of blocks to the very top, and then another brilliant cutscene. Remember the cutscenes are all from our perspective. And so the blocks of the world suddenly start moving and slamming down around us or shooting up from the floor in front of us to try and trap us in this living maze. Thankfully, we dodge everything and finally reach the firewall core. We have to fight and kill one of the viruses and then manage to free the portals again. Once we do, travel to Five Isle is now possible from anywhere, not just Orlando's apartment. With the Isles free, we can join the admins at a local water village and heal some injured fighters, then go to take on the demons again. And I'd like to point out the demons have an actual sci-fi spaceship, like a full-on low-orbit craft flying round in a circle. I would have never thought to combine demons with sci-fi tech. The main water temple of the area is again absolutely gorgeous. There are very few enemies around here and it feels a bit more like Uncharted. Journeying through the incredible landscape and exploring an undiscovered location, the ferns and bushes peeking up from behind the fallen pillars of an ancient temple. At the very top of this multi-leveled spiralled outdoor temple, we talk to the core of the stream, the elemental god of water in Otherland. They bless us with the power of water. Then a cutscene shows a ball of water expanding in the sky so large it floods the land and washes away all the demons, much like the forest did earlier. With the blessing of water sorted, we take the longest light tube yet and fly all the way back across the island, looping and dipping between crumbling temple pillars and narrowly avoiding the jagged cliff faces. This is an incredible moment. But the next quest unfortunately goes right back to the Collect X system and has me finding energy containers. You know, the situations and the locations in this game can be incredible and when the game focuses on those, when it puts its environments front and centre, it's brilliant. I wouldn't even need a quest to want to explore these places. And when you put in Collect X or Kill 10 or Kill 20 quests, you're actually losing one of the best elements of your game, and that is the environments. You can have me walk through an entire environment to get from the quest start to the quest finish and have absolutely nothing happen beyond the journey. Your environments are good enough to do that. Collect 10 things. Defend from waves of demons. Go forth and kill 20 demons. Close five magical demon portals. This is a lovely open expanse of swamp and marsh with the demon hordes roaming around. But it's just so samey on the gameplay element. This is a badass demon statue in the middle of a relatively boring gameplay section. It's such a strange juxtaposition of quality and repetition. Now, we lead an admin-based assault against the Celestial Dragon's stronghold. Apparently, she's been leading the demons in this area. Now, this temple is incredible. It's a massive area, a vast expanse of shallow water with an ancient temple built on top of it. Old stone steps flanked by imposing dragon statues leading to a moss-covered walkway, connected to paths which all snake toward the temple proper. The lighting and light rays filtering down are incredible. The ambience of the chirping swamp and the ethereal temple soundtrack all combine to make this celestial dragon temple one of the best set pieces in the game. With the help of the admins, we hack into the temple, then the spirit of the 
stream joins us and we turn several swirling vortexes of water into water elementals to fight alongside us. Then we build some robotic looking defense turrets to keep the demons away from the temple and now the water temple is mostly fixed. With the water spirit's blessing we can return to the monastery. We are unfortunately unable to get into the celestial dragon's stronghold right now but don't worry we'll be going there later. Back at the monastery, we use our new water powers to summon some water orbs in the garden and then chat to them. They will help grow the food and fight any fires that may happen, and now the game takes a rather complex turn. Each of the five main admin NPCs now has a rather long questline for me, and most of the questlines are just walking from place to place and then back again, sometimes with the killing of 20 enemies or the finding of 20 items. This content only exists to pad out the runtime. It's not necessarily engaging gameplay or plot-related stuff. For example, I need to go to the Lambda Mall and join the security force and kill some hackers in the lower bad sector to get the Lambda Mall to support us in the fight back against the Neo Grail. This is a lovely location, but it's nothing we haven't seen before, and all of it ends up bringing us back to the monastery. After we've completed every single side quest line, we simply talk to Orlando, and then we investigate the rips and tears in reality that have started to appear around the monastery. The rips are portals, and heading through them leads us directly to the Celestial Dragon's Fortress, meaning the demons are planning a major assault directly against the monastery. So we have to disable as much of the army as we can, and the Celestial Dragon's Fortress is another mind-blowing location. Brilliant white and baby blue, a structured crisscross of bridges and balconies above a military marching route. You can look down and see the demonic army marching in formation below, or look up and see the endless blue void. So Orlando gets to work on stopping the Celestial Dragon's computer systems and we defend him. In a rather annoying touch, the computer consoles are found at the back of a tunnel and not in the fantastic crisscross center, but we are only here for a few minutes anyway. With the Celestial Dragon's Palace cleared out, we are transported back to the monastery up to this sky platform overlooking the entire place. And we can see fires, explosions, and multiple demonic portals in the sky surrounding the whole monastery platform and all connected aisles. The demons have launched the invasion and everything is being destroyed. All the aisles are in trouble and we need to go and help everyone one of them. The wood district and the walkway to the dock is on fire, and the tree spirit defences we created earlier are charred and black, so we put the flames out. The water district approach, those sparkling waterfalls and pools of water, they've all been poisoned and tainted, so we clean those up. And the fire isle is fighting back valiantly. Remember, the fire isle is the militant wing of the five isles, so they're actually standing up to the demons okay, but they've got their own problems. We'll sort those out later. Thankfully, they are able to spare a small squad of soldiers to help defend us. With the isles relatively stabilised, the admins gather in the centre of the monastery. The plan is to block the firewall using the technology that the Neo Grail used earlier and and make it so travel to the monastery is blocked to them, buying us some time to mount a defence. We get an awesome cutscene, all is going pretty well, and then boom, the Neo Grail appear again, and the admins are actually cut down. I didn't expect this to fail. Nice subversion of expectations. And it's our old Neo Grail friend, the Apothecary. The one who created the undead army back in 8 squared. They've got a deal for us. They will repel the demons and save the monastery. But in exchange for that favour, we need to give them some of our code permanently. It seems the experiences we've had up to now with the blessings of all the lords are actually very valuable to the Neo Grail, and with no other choice, we agree to this, losing a portion of our power for the exchanged safety of the monastery. Now, losing the power doesn't affect you in any way, it's likely just a story beat for later, because we've been blessed by the forest and the water gods, and now the Neo Grail has that blessed code, which probably won't be great for us. But there's one god's blessing we've not yet got, the Fire Isle, so we fight our way over there. If the Fire Lord says we're cool and we get his approval, we will have the combined blessings of the three Five Isle spirits and hopefully be strong enough to take on the Neo Grail directly. So we board the warship and set off to the Fire Isle. Remember, last time we were here, the High General had just been assassinated by the spy Neo Grail monster and we were run out of town. It's not been doing great in our absence. There's been an uprising since we left, with several traitor generals joining the demons and usurping power of the entire isle. So we journey to the Temple of Flame and rescue the few remaining loyalist soldiers. Down in the temple tombs, we meet our old friend Koshin, the one general who trusted us, one of the remaining good guys. He is preparing to launch a counterattack against the traitor legions, but he needs our help. He needs a lot of our help. 
So the Fire Isle is in trouble. They're battling a demonic invasion, and the Dark Army has made a reappearance, and the previous generals are all vying for power to become the new High General, leading to a mass of allegiances and loyalties all clashing. And among all this, the Fire Lord, that's the guiding spirit of fire, has been captured and is being held prisoner somewhere. So with no fire spirit to guide or guard the land, the Fire Isle loyalist troops are falling back and are losing, even under the command of the fantastic Koshin. So I journey up this mountainside path to an airship camp, pushing through the forest, fighting alongside Koshin. We spend about an hour pushing the Dark Army back, and the enemy health has been balanced around here to actually need the damage over time to kill. It's no longer a case of dots being overpowered, it's now a case of them being necessary. I kill some soldiers, close some portals, and even take down some Dark Army army generals and finally through the rubble and destruction we have our rematch with the dark army king the fight uses the same mechanic he surrounds himself with an invulnerability bubble while summoning hordes of enemies and whenever he's vulnerable i throw a dot onto him and even with the power of the dots he is tough as nails to take down i actually really like the balancing of this section it's proof that if the game got the numbers right it would be a terrific adventure the dark army king escapes again but i have a feeling we'll find him again and we push on to the the armory, killing the corrupted traitor Fire Isle soldiers as we go, then rescuing some of the goodest of boys while breaking the terracotta furnaces to slow the production of even more corrupted soldiers. The armory itself is a vast expanse of machinery, metal buildings and craters in the ground where lava bubbles up from. Into the main armory we go, scatter some mines around the place, blow it up and then return to the central pantheon of flame, the last bastion where the loyalists and the admins are holding out a final defence. The game again splits into multiple side quests for various people and I need to finish multiple actually quite long quest lines for five different people. Each quest line ends in me receiving a piece of epic armor, meaning that just by playing the game you'll always be geared up and armed appropriately. In fact, finishing the final quest is currently the only way to get a legendary weapon. The first quest line sees me hunting down some lost scrolls through the demolished and forgotten jungle city, and this environment with the crumbling walls and overgrown foliage and cult-like idols dotted around is absolutely 10 out of 10. This game is a visual masterpiece. I would say it's a diamond in the rough, but it's not quite a diamond, not yet. It's a chunk of jagged rock with a diamond in it. There's beauty here to be found, but it needs a lot of polishing to be serviceable. It's an adventure and a half, no denying that. But there's still many flaws, and as more people play, we are becoming aware of more flaws and more bug reports are being sent. Next, we're inside the remains of the ancient temple, and we are hunting down clues for the location of the legendary Blade of Flame, one of the few weapons powerful enough to help or harm the Spirit of Flame. So if we get it, we'll not only be keeping the spirit safe, but we'll be able to free him later. You have to read the history of the blade on these stone tablets, then operate the giant occult monolith in the correct order to slide the wall open and take the blade from its golden plinth atop these stairs. This is a brilliant part of the game. This is a proper old school classic jungle hunting temple trekking adventure. With the blade retrieved, we run to the edge of the floating island we're currently on and dive into the open sky below, with Sweetie Cheng slowing our fall with, apparently, magic. The cutscenes have returned to their glorious insanity too, falling with style and dodging between rocks and boulders in the sky. There is a lot visually to love here. With the Sword of Flame secure, we board a rebel ship and cutscene. Sweetie Cheng actually manages to use some Neo-like powers to shield us from cannon fire and then even guide some of the larger enemy ships to crash into each other in mid-air. Next, we're off to a ship construction yard. At this point, even while playing, all the quests are beginning to blur together. It's like the designers were so excited to get me from set piece to set piece, they sort of forgot to write any good reason to actually be there. But I'm not complaining, because the ship design yard is another beautiful place to be. It's the upstandard early area quest of freeing some slaves, killing some bad guys, saving loyalist soldiers, interact, combat, interact, lather, rinse, repeat. We're sent to find Su Ping, a loyalist captain, and man, this wooden structure is something else. It's a dry dock for building airships, but the dock is empty while the framework around the edge remains, so we can climb higher and higher up the sloped surfaces until we're at the top layer of this construction lattice. Su Ping is being held in a prison, so we kill the jailer for a key and then release them, then set off to break five cannons. Because if the loyalists can't have cannons, then I'm absolutely not letting the traitor factions have cannons against us. With the airship construction 
Tony are taken care of and the cannons sabotaged, we meet up with some of the admins on the edge of a dusty path between the larger villages and wait. One of the leaders of the traitor legions is walking down, so we ambush them, kill their elite guard, and interrogate them. They're an absolute coward without their honour guard, and so they will stop this usurpation and stay out of our way while we kill the remaining enemy forces. Fantastic, one faction down. Back to the main Pantheon base to finish another questline and gain another epic item. Almost completed my epic helmet now, looking pretty swish. Actually, looking like I did back in episode one in the training area. It comes full circle. I like that. Now we're off to the Fire Army Garrison. More burning villagers, more items to collect, and eventually we fight through the traitor-controlled Fire Army capital city, the place we were chased out of last time we were here. Free some good guys, because it's becoming the standard quest design by now, then return to the Grand Castle and take down the Torturer, some high-level Neo Grail dude keeping some of the Loyalist captains locked up. Rescue the Fire Army commander, and then, before we leave this place, we bomb the city. And I'm super impressed by this, because we do plant bombs around this building, set them off, and then I go back and check, and the building has actually burnt down. There is a graphical change from before and after. That's a really nice touch. Back in the main Pantheon base, we are one step closer to finding the Fire Lord and gaining his blessing, while also freeing the Fire Isle from its multiple invaders. We interrogate a Dark Army soldier for more info down in the tombs. We don't get much, but we do get a location. The staging ground for the Dark Army's invasion on Fire Isle. So with what few Loyalists we can muster, we march across the land into the Dark Army fort, sabotage the entrance gate, light the fireworks signal to call the cavalry, and then charge inside, taking the fight directly to them. We kill a load of bad guys, interact with some glowing red flags to boost morale, which is a better way of boosting morale than I did last time, sabotage several Dark Army locator devices, you know, generally be a nuisance to the Dark Army, and then again confront the Black King. This time he's looking all high and mighty on this pedestal, which is essentially a spaceship dock. Seems they are using demonic technology to enhance their own army. As usual, we don't fight the King himself, but several waves of Dark Army soldiers he sends at us, and once we've cleared the waves, he's gone again. He's probably going to be a reoccurring villain. With the Dark Army camp destroyed, Koshin guides us to his airship. We are chased by some Dark Army troops, but it does seem that Sweetie Cheng is also a flamethrower, and in this cutscene she just incinerates everyone pursuing us. With the traitors sensing defeat and fleeing the city, Koshin insists we finish this and we give chase. We sneak back into the main city and free even more captured Loyalist soldiers, kill even more bad guys, and then take down five rebel engineers to cripple their airship combat capabilities. Then we collect ten ship parts to repair Koshin's ship and make ours better. I know I'm condensing like two hours of questing into a five minute segment, but honestly very little actually happens here beyond walking from place A to place B and killing many, many, many enemies. It's nothing we haven't seen before. It's fun for me to play through, but there's not really much of a story that I can add without saying, and then I killed more, and then I killed more, and then I killed more. It's not bad. The areas are nice and the combat is working fine, but it's not noteworthy enough to document. Grab some airship fuel from the mining pits down below, then head to the Royal Chambers again and search for clues about the location of the Firemaster. Read some scrolls and it seems they've been captured and are being held prisoner on the peak of a nearby mountain. A place only really accessible by airship, but thankfully we have an airship. But before I can escape, I am ambushed by traitor soldiers and locked up. Doesn't last very long though because Koshin, the absolute bro he is, arrives and rescues me. So with the Fire Lord location, we head back to Koshin's airship and embark on a rescue mission of our own. The airship section is fantastic. Flying around the mountain in real time, we are chased down by the traitor legions and boarded, so we fight off the attacking soldiers, arm the cannons below deck, and fire back, then run around and put out all the fires that break out on our ship. This is a properly adrenaline-packed section of the game. Airship pirates through and through, and I loved it. The rescue attempt is going pretty well until we are shot down by the traitor army, but thankfully we're able to crash land on the correct mountain just at the bottom. It seems only Koshin and myself survived, so he tells me it's been an absolute honour to fight alongside me, and we should make one final charge together to the top and stage an all-or-nothing two-man assault to free the Fire Lord. At this point, the music kicks it up a notch. The pathfinding AI for Koshin is perfect. The enemy aggro detection works. The combat is connecting. 
It's just an absolutely incredible set piece of running, fighting up a mountain to the very top, then through the crashing spray of a waterfall, past the jagged rocks of the mountainside and onto the searing apex of this enormous mountain. An apex built as an open air temple with ornate floor and red laser fences holding us back. We fight alongside Koshin, pushing back wave after wave of traitor soldiers until finally reaching the captured Fire Lord and using the power of the flame blade to release him from his prison. The Fire Master thanks us and rewards us with the blessing of flame and will aid Koshin in retaking the city and appoints Koshin as High General. Koshin thanks us for all of our help and he says he will order the loyalist fire soldiers to protect the monastery from now until the end of time. And with that quest complete, we can choose which legendary weapon we want to get. I go for this awesome jewel-tipped polearm. With the blessing of the forest spirit, the water spirit and the fire lord, and each isle now saved and the monastery under the protection of the fire isle army, we return and let Orlando know that we are poised and ready to attack the Neo Grail directly. We have every blessing we can get, every ally at our side and we are strong enough to strike back and then we are done. The legendary weapon is the final quest reward. The main storyline ends here. There are no more quests. Hitting level 60 has unlocked the daily quests for us, which increase reputation among the various factions in Otherland and allow us to buy epic items from the faction's specific vendors. Or I could go and hunt down the seven secret epic recipe shops. Remember, we found one by accident in a biome back on the bug planet. Or I could take on one of the very short dungeons with another player and hope for an epic recipe drop, maybe complete the admin's side quests I missed earlier. There is still content in the game to do, but as for the main storyline, as for Otherland, I feel I've finished it. The next quest on my quest list that would continue the story requires level 64, and as 60 is the max, there's no way to even find where this quest would start, so this is it. Otherland. A strange game. A project started with all the ambition in the universe and the developing talent to match. A game originally developed to generate one billion dollars in revenue. An MMORPG set in one of the most fantastical fictional lands and destined to turn the online gaming landscape on its head that, as we know, now languishes at the bottom of the Steam charts. Otherland was a beautiful idea, built by incredible people that never quite came to be. It's a testament to the ambition and the passion of a talented few guided by the wrong people. Otherland is one of the best adventures I've ever been on. It's a visual spectacle, an audio dream. It's got some of the nicest locations I've ever played through. And honestly, the biggest weakness of this game is how they tried to make it into an MMO. It was made by people who understood single player games. And for the most part, it plays like a single player game. But it's the MMO touches, the kill X quests or collect X quests, things added only because an MMO have them that weakens this experience. Honestly, if you removed the grind, replaced it with environmental exploration and focused on your strengths instead, remove the kill 10 demons and just make it kill one tough demon, give it a Dark Souls or a Bloodborne style combat system, make it a God of War style hack and slash, and you'd have one of the best adventure games ever made. So what happens now? Well, I started this adventure as one of the only players in the game, but that's not the case anymore. Many of you have started playing. Drago have even brought someone on board to keep the servers stable, and there are talks about the game's future. So while that is still very much an unsure thing, it's not impossible that Otherland may find that it experiences quite the renaissance thanks to both this series and player interest. As for this channel, I'll be able to return to the worst MMO ever series. I'll be able to cover more modern MMOs, and I think I'll wait some time before taking on a project of this size again. As for the game, I will keep playing. Very much so. I want to increase my faction reputation. I want to try those dungeons. I want to finish the subquests I've missed. But should you play Otherland? Remember, this isn't a diamond yet. It's a lump of rock with something very special about it, something intoxicating, something magical, a certain perfection that's actually enhanced by the smaller imperfections. It's a flawed masterpiece, no doubt. With some development upgrades and not an insubstantial amount of work, it could become something incredible, something to go down in history as rising from the ashes. Will that happen? Who knows? But it's free to download and play. And if you've got the determination to finish it, 
it's one hell of an adventure. The final quest saw us gain the blessings of all of the Five Isle Lords and enlist the Fire Isle to protect the monastery. We are ready for the Neo Grail whenever they decide to return. And if that does happen, you can guarantee I'll be there leading the charge. And as of today, our epic journey through the Otherland MMO ends. Thank you for joining me on this unforgettable adventure. Thank you to all the people who joined the Otherland Discord and helped each other make it past the broken quests. Thank you to Drago Entertainment for talking to me and keeping this masterpiece alive. And thank you to the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who allowed this adventure to happen. It really has been quite the journey. If you've enjoyed this series or you'd like to support the future of the channel via Patreon or you'd like to join our Discord or come watch and chat to me live on Twitch, check the video description for links to all of them. And as always, until our next epic adventure, have a great day.